So, the last few days, um, we were <coughs> studying or discussing about the Buddha Dhamma <coughs> based on the traditional category of uh, view, meditation, and uh, conduct. Of course, in very brief. So today, um, I will attempt to sort of uh, summarize um, what we have, uh, what we have uh, talked in the last few days. <coughs> I think we can um, summarize in maybe say uh, four sections. Um, as I said before, that uh, I was attempting to uh, <coughs> um, base my talk uh, on the this uh, one verse. In the Mahamudra aspiration prayers, mm -hmm. where it talks about these three view meditation and conduct, and uh, <coughs> where it says that uh, having a clear conviction or being free from all the doubts about the ground which refers to true truth, truth, is the confidence of view. And uh, sustaining without uh, or, or practicing that view without a distraction is the meditation, <coughs> the point of meditation or the essence of meditation. And uh, Enhancing or developing the skill to the view and meditation, all those activities or behaviors are we can call uh, conduct. <coughs> so these are very related to each other, and we can also talk about the result. Uh, for instance, <coughs> the two kayas as a result, which comes from practicing the view, meditation and conduct. Um, so, as I also said that the view is like uh, having an eye, knowing where to go. And meditation and conduct is like having a body and the leg to you have some tools, you have something that you can actually uh, uh, tools uh, that you can uh, reach to that uh, goal. <coughs> So 
I think at the beginning, um, as a preliminary section, the first, um, we talked about um, how to um, make our Dharma practice um, the real genuine, how to distinguish between the imitation Dharma and the real Dharma. <coughs> And we were talking about the um, this uh, whatever that uh, encourages or that triggers or that uh, brings disturbances or in a way say whatever uh, triggers our emotion emotions such as ignorance uh, attachment angers. We can identify those as a non dharma, and whatever <coughs> the activities that brings us peace, or that uh, encourage us, or that uh, triggers our compassion, our openness, and our uh, uh, loving kindness, these are we can consider as a dharma. So, I think the imitation dharma is okay to start. We cannot say this is not totally non-dharma, but it is important to move from just being uh, imitating to the real. And uh, I was also talking that in order to do that, make our dharma genuine, it is also very important to question ourselves what we really want and to listen our inner uh, intuitive voice. <coughs> so, um, to do that, I think I said two things as related to the story of the maintaining teacher that two things you have to do um, giving up attachment to the concerns of this life and making one's mind uh, mingle or one as dharma so these are two things so if our practice is somehow related to concerning these lives. We talk about the eight worldly conscience, eight worldly dharmas. Then there's something is not genuine. So we have to check and we have to get rid of those. <coughs> um, the second thing, the making your mind as a Dharma is that Dharma the mind itself should become a Dharma not like a Dharma is some sort of activities that you do and even Julie you will reach somewhere so it's very important whether it is suffering whether it is talking about illusion whether it is talking about the realization Dharma, non-Dharma everything has to always check our mind and see what is the state of mind. If your state of mind is Dharma, then it is Dharma, regardless of the activity. So, suffering, cause of suffering, happiness, cause of happiness, or Dharma or non Dharma, everything always has to be checked in our mind. So, that is what the second meaning that making our mind one with the Dharma. <coughs> so these are some, um, I think, uh, as I remember, the preliminary uh, or the points that we have discussed in the preliminary section. And now the view, 
So, first of all, to summarize, we can say the view should be the middle way. And what does it mean? Is that view should be free from the extremes of uh, nihilism and the eternalism. When you have that kind of view, then you have a view. <coughs> and I think related to the view, uh, we talked about like having a Buddhist view. Uh, we can say that uh, when you understand the three jewel, you have a one kind of Buddhist view. So uh, we can understand three jewel. As I said, the three jewels can be <coughs> like a GPS you know, guide, Buddha as a guide, Dharma as a path, and uh, Sangha as a server who serves the Dharma. <coughs> So one way to look at the um, three jewel is the Buddha as a supreme teacher, Dharma as a supreme protector, and Sangha as a supreme guide. Sometimes, uh, <clears throat> but uh, as I think to make it a little more practical. Um, when we talk about the three jewel, we're not talking about somewhere out there, but it's also more like remembering ourselves, like our as being a Buddhist. This is our vision, our strategy, and our resources. So in this context, enlightenment is our vision, Buddha. And in order to achieve that, what we need, we need a strategy, which is a Dharma practices that we were discussing about the six parameters, all these uh, bodhicitta and so forth, renunciation. And uh, Sangha is our resources in the sense that so, can I also be enlightened? Is it possible? Do I have a potential of enlightenment or not? You know, these are all we can um, investigate whether ourselves. So, what kind of support, mental support I have? What kind of physical support I have? Do I have all of that, or something is missing? So, the, until you believe that you have all this, it's hard to start. <coughs> And then you can, so when we say the Buddhist or Buddhist view, and let's say taking refuge, uh, we have to understand what is three jewels and how it is related to our practice. This is one way to look at. But uh, also from another way to look at is that understanding the Dharma among the three jewels actual refuge, because we are taking actual refuge to the Dharma, in the sense that when you accept the Dharma, then you become a Buddhist. So, we also talked about this four seals, yeah, so, mm, accepting the four realities, the all conditioned phenomena are impermanent, all contaminate phenomena are suffering, all the phenomena are um, empty and devoid of self, and nirvana is peace or beyond any kind of uh, mental fabrications. <coughs> so it is important to know that what they mean, and not only that, but one should train to accept these realities when it happens to <coughs> our life, 
and react accordingly <coughs> instead of denying those reality and then you have a, a view and also we talked about the because when you don't have a right view you have a ignorance uh, which will uh, bring a lot of suffering such as a mistaken um, rob as a snake and you get scared so that's a problem <coughs> and understanding this uh, is important that uh, wrong view brings suffering because of that it's important to have a right view and again from the Buddhist point of view the first uh, uh, practical view that we should practice is understanding the Four Noble Truths the suffering cause of suffering the path and <coughs> cessation in the path <coughs> and in order to understand Four Noble Truths the, among the Four Noble Truths the two cause in suffering which is to be rejected and path in cessation which is to be accepted but uh, to understand the uh, Four Noble Truths we also has to understand the two truth. So we talked about the conventional truth, we talked about the ultimate truth and conventional truth is the how things appear to us, what is reality for us, appearance, experience and the ultimate truth is how things really are which is beyond our um, ordinary experiences which is beyond conceptual mind <coughs> so it is like a seeing rope as a rope or would be the ultimate truth and seeing <coughs> rope as a snake and being scared will be the conventional truth <coughs> and uh, in, in order to understand the four noble truth um, and how they are related as a cause and condition um, it is also important to understand the law of dependent origination so because the whole Four Noble Truth is based on the law of dependent origination so we talked about the dependent origination so you can also say that it's a part of the view understanding the dependent origination and as in fact Buddha encouraged a lot uh, <clears throat> not only Buddha but also the other uh, masters that uh, engaging with the ultimate truth is impossible or is very difficult dangerous so how to do that is in order to understand the ultimate truth we have to understand the conventional truth which is understanding the dependent origination so the more you understand the dependent origination the more you will understand the emptiness four noble truths and uh, two truths all of them make sense <coughs> so the basic idea of dependent origination is as I was saying that that's a two word um, then, even though I think uh, there's many ways to explain it, but I think if these are the two main essential points of the uh, word that dependent means all the phenomena comes by depending on the causes and conditions. So no phenomena comes without cause. And the second del is that phenomena arises 
prompt the cause and condition. But not only that, there's a specific relationship between that cause and the that result. So it's not randomly. We might know, we might not know, but there's a, there's a law of having the certain kind of relationship between cause and result. That is very important. Because the whole mechanism of karma, whole mechanism of past and future love, and whole mechanism of relationship between the to the suffering and to the origin and to the cessation and to the parties because of this logic that's a certain relationship. So when the cause is there, result will be there. When the cause is eliminated, result won't be there. <coughs> And also it helps us to um, understand this middle way because the, when we understand that all the result is based on the cause, it will eliminate the wrong view of uh, nihilism. And then when we understand the second one, the Cause and result has a relationship, so phenomena doesn't come from somewhere where there's nothing relationship. So it helps us to free from the view of eternal, uh, eternalism. Because it makes us question what is the relationship between, you know, this which we consider as a cause, which has nothing to do with relationship with what is happening here. <coughs> And I also emphasize a little bit about that as a Buddhist, sometimes there are very foundational practices and the wisdoms that we kind of overlooked or underestimate, such as Four Noble Truths and 16 aspects of Four Noble Truths. And um, we just heard the name and said, oh, I know this, yeah, and these are a little bit incorrect because it's uh, there's much much deeper that we can understand that if you understand such as the 16 aspects of four noble truths it can really uh, eliminate so much frequently asked questions or uh, the doubts that we might have when we practice you know um, such as is enlightenment possible or not, uh, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so I think, yeah, so to make it short, the view is understanding the ground, and these are some ground understanding as a Buddhist we should have. And uh, basically, the when you understand all of this, then you will be always have this middle way view, which does not fall into the extremes of nihilist, nihilist or existent and non-existent, and which is like a ground for all our other practices. And also, when you have that kind of understanding, and there is something to be meditated on, because without a view. We can meditate, but then it's hard to be improved and grow. It's like there's no seed. <coughs> so I think these are the some uh, topics that we talked in the view. Mm. And the second, uh, in the meditation, so I was try to focus uh, because the um, so usually we say that meditation is that uh, middle way meditation because it is free from uh, you can say it is free from two extremes of exaggerations and denigrations. Yeah? 
sometimes we also use the word like uh, over excitement and over dullness so you have to have this. so it's, I was trying to say that uh, many techniques to do meditation but meditation is more like balanced mind when your mind is in the balance and not too excited, not too disappointed, or not exaggerating it, or not denigrating it, and seeing, being as it is, is the like essence and core of all the our meditations. Then the, from the technique wise, then we can say shamatha meditation, vipassana meditation, or analytical meditation, resting meditation, but all these are different techniques of meditation. But the essence or the nature of meditation is very much like this. So it's important to keep that in mind. <clears throat> and again, I was also saying that uh, in a way, meditation is sustaining whatever view that you have by understanding all this dependent origination to truth, for noble truth, yeah, whatever. So we have that kind of certainty mind which is not very stable or not very clear. Uh, maybe in, it's a little bit in the understanding level, not in the experiential level. So meditation is trying to um, go from understanding to the med, uh, experience and the realization level, that the certainty mind that you have, which comes from studying. So I think, uh, we were talking about the meaning of practice at the beginning and I was trying to say that uh, practice means uh, creating uh, these healthy habits right? and it's also like working with the mind and it's also uh, very important to take care of our mind. We do take care of our body but many times we forget. So meditation is like taking care of our mind so that our that, so that our mind become healthy, so to speak, as we take care of our body, so that our body become healthy. And also, I was saying that you have to be a uh, little bit, uh, how to say, patient with the meditation, because it means creating a habit. Right? It takes time, so creating this healthy habit. <coughs> And I think we also talked about a little bit the, um, the sequence or uh, I think I said that uh, like we need a knowledge, we need a structure and we need a continuity. Because without the knowledge you cannot start. But just knowledge doesn't do anything. So you have to start some structure. Okay, this I have to do today one week, one month. And also giving a continuity. Continuity is doing whatever. Because it's like building a habit by bits of bits. And um, we also talk about these three essential points of meditation or practice, which is very important especially if you are uh, doing the proper dhamma meditations if you're just doing therapeutic meditation maybe then um, you don't need all of them but if you really doing a, a whole package dhamma meditation then these three things are as it is mentioned in the text that uh, revulsion or the renunciation first one second one devotion and the third one the awareness so these three things are said like uh, revulsion is like a, um, mm, head of meditation and devotion is like a, uh, what was the devotion? Revulsion. Revulsion. Yeah, so one is head and one is a body. Yeah, one is feet. 
one is faith. So, mm -hmm. Revolution is like a, a revolution is like sorry, revolution is like a feed up meditation. Mm -hmm. Without it, you cannot start. Mm -hmm. And the um, devotion is like a body. And, and awareness was the head, one was head. Mm. Devotion is head of meditation. Yeah. Awareness is body. Awareness is and body. Revulsion is the foot of meditation. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. So these three things are mm, considered as uh, three essential points of meditation. <coughs> Uh, you start with the revolution, and then top of that, devotion is important because without a devotion, uh, there is no blessing. So that awareness is the actual, the almost like the result of the nature of meditation, being aware, not being distracted. And then we also talked about, I think, uh, the four, um, the four attachment, yeah. Um, as in general, uh, obscurations or the obstructions of our practice in meditation. So, if you attach to this life. You are not practitioner, you are not Dhamma practitioner. If you attach to uh, your own self-centric uh, concerns, and then you, are, you don't have a bodhicitta, and if you attach to the samsaric uh, concerns, you don't have a uh, renunciation, and if you have a grasping or clinging, whether it is, it is not, or anything, extremes, you don't have a view. Mm. Yeah? So these are some related with the renunciation, devotion and awareness somehow, which are the opposite of uh, our practice, <clears throat> which is to be recognized and to be, try to be free from those. And also, I think we talked about the sequence as in the. So you start with the renunciation, and then move to the bodhicitta, and to the wisdom. So if you, you know, put every your practices as a sequence, and these are also called the three principal aspects of path. Start with the renunciation, focus on the bodhicitta which will turn into the wisdom. So as a beginner, it is important to emphasize on the renunciation. <coughs> so, yeah, I think these were the some um, points that we have discussed in the section of uh, meditation and again the mind the, 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 as it says here the awareness the balanced mind not caught up by distraction or uh, excitement and the disappointment mind that stable mind is the essence of the meditation or in another way, you can also say that the mind that is free from the exaggeration and the denigration. That is the essence, you can say, the nature of the meditation in a way. So, after that, I think in the section of conduct, uh, was, I think, overview that we discuss, where we discuss about this the three, uh, the four, three, um, how to say, um, you have so three problems, 
uh, three causes of problem, the three prescriptions and three medicines, right? So as in general. So you have a suffering that is always comes from related to like suffering that is related to um, not getting what we want, encountering what we don't want, or there's a certain kind of anxiety that we have that is coming from not knowing what's going to happen. So we can relate it to these three things, suffering that comes from attachment, uh, anger and the ignorance, you know? so not knowing is ignorance. And as a result we have the three causes, um, of course, aversion, attachment and uh, ignorance. So ignorance in the sense that not knowing the reality, uh, not knowing the Four Noble Truths, not knowing the um, three, uh, four realities, four sins, those kind of things. And uh, as a solution, we have uh, three um, prescriptions, which is also known as Dharma Scriptures. So you have a Buddha's teaching that is categorized into the Sutra, Vinaya, and uh, Abhidharma. And so what it prescribes is that as a three medicine is that we have a discipline, we have a practice of discipline, practice of concentration, and practice of wisdom. So Vinaya prescribes the um, discipline, the Sutra prescribes the concentration, and the Abhidhamma prescribes the wisdom. So we can take these three kind of medicines in order to heal these three um, sufferings by uh, eliminating the three causes of suffering, which are three poisons. <coughs> and also you can check what is your obvious problem. Some people have more problem that is coming from attachment, some people have anger, you know, and then you can practice accordingly. Like if you have a headache, you take headache medicine. If you have a stomach problem, you can take a stomach problem. So this twelve sets of four, three, three, three. And uh, we also talked about the order of our practice. So uh, or the conduct, as uh, as I was saying, that this three prescription or the medicine has a order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's important to take, uh, follow the order because it's like taking medicine. You cannot take too much; you will be overdose. But you cannot take too less because it cannot have the effect. So, so you have to start with the discipline, and through the discipline. You have a concentration and a wisdom. <clears throat> and again, I was saying that uh, without a discipline, concentration and wisdom are impossible. So there's a certain kind of causes and condition, uh, result relationship. So wisdom comes from the concentration, and concentration depends on the discipline. Right? So it's important to have all of them together. But there are also uh, different levels of path where you have to emphasize. <coughs> I was saying that at the beginning it's important to emphasize on the we practice all of them together, but must emphasize on the discipline. You know, they slowly move into the concentration, and when you become a more expert, then maybe discipline all this become more natural, you can just emphasize that on the wisdom. So in here, concentration is the stability aspects of our mind, and the wisdom is the clarity aspects of our mind. <coughs> and uh, also, I think I was talking about this, that in order uh, as a Let's say, loving, understanding the suffering, yeah, that's important. Because understanding the suffering of oneself and other triggers the 
loving kindness. Loving kindness brings the compassion and put together become a, a which is our conventional bodhicitta, which will bring the ultimate bodhicitta for the enlightenment. So you see, understanding, as Buddha said, that understand the suffering in the four noble truths, all the way up to the cessation. They are linked to each other. <clears throat> so it's very important to have this understanding of the suffering. In, because there's many different layers of suffering we have. We're not talking about just the misery suffering. So more you understand, more there's a flexibility. <clears throat> and as a actual practice, we were talking about the intention, importance of intention in you know, a bodhicitta mm -hmm. as a all in one medicine. And there are some misunderstanding about bodhicitta that uh, one is that, oh, maybe it sounds sweet, it sounds nice, you know. And it might sound like advertisement slogan, but it's not because if you ask Buddhist, it is Buddhist always say that what is the main reason of illusion, confusion, suffering? We always talk about this clinging, self clinging, self cherishing. Yeah. So this is the all the problem that comes from. So then if you ask, so what is the all in one medicine that we can practice in order to eliminate all kind of problems? healthy, uh, that never gone wrong, never going to going to uh, be, uh, that, that, that one medicine is, we can prescribe is bodhicitta. And bodhicitta has a two aspects, so it has a wisdom aspect, which is enlightenment, and it has a compassion aspect, which is in order to help the sentient beings. And when you combine these two, reaching enlightenment in order to help the sentient being combined together comes the bodhicitta mind that is aspired to enlightenment for the sake of everyone but again here yeah, now one uh, mistake we might have is that oh so it might sound like a political slogan that oh you know first i will become enlightened then i will help sentient beings but it's not that way. it means that you have to, it's more like a gesture of that. I want to help, but I want to do it in limitless way, you know, what we can do. Because I can do something to help human to human, but it's very limited. Mm. So only Buddha has a, this quality to doing it in limitless way. And that's why we're saying that I will help from, from the activities of Buddha by becoming a Buddha. So it's not like a, this political voting slogans. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's a big reason why we say this. So it's a gesture of saying that I want to help but the biggest way, you know, mm -hmm. limitless way, not the limited way. <clears throat> and I think we talked about also the importance of when we practice, um, how to practice is that we practice through the four immeasurable. Yeah? So immeasurable or the boundless loving kindness, mm -hmm. compassion, joyfulness, and the equanimity. And each of them are each of them eliminates certain kind of disturbing emotions that we go through, mm -hmm. such as jealousy, anger, attachment, discriminative. Mm -hmm. you know? For example, when you practice the equanimity, first of all many problems arises is thinking that I deserve this he doesn't yeah, she doesn't yeah or, yeah it's suffering but it's not my suffering mm -hmm. so when you have this inequality view then so many emotions are triggered the moment you believe that everyone deserves happiness and if you feel like this happiness is the birthright of every sentient being, then so many problems can be solved because it makes sense, you know. It makes sense to help people, not through the empathetic or emotional, but he's a sentient being, 
if there's no one to be served, and if there's anything I can do, why not? You know, regardless of his suffering, my suffering. And also to do that, the biggest, very important part is to think, don't insist oneself, yeah? Like, think unbiasedly, like, okay, so what happens when I get this self-cherished mind? Does it disturb me or it brings me peace? What happens when I practice a little bit of compassion or this equal equanimity? Does it bring happiness, peace? positive things or negative things. And so you have to convince through the reality mm -hmm. instead of, oh, bodhicitta, important, insisting it doesn't have work like that. So as I was saying, that you have to take care of your mind like the way how you deal with your elephant, you know, when you tame elephant, you cannot force. So it, you have to first communicate, you have to make nice contact, and then you conquer them through law not to the uh, war, so to speak. <clears throat> and also we talked about this, I think, um, so how to generate or how to develop this strength, this bodhicitta. We talked about the four causes, conditions and the power. So Four causes are born in the lineage, and one, the second, to relying on the spiritual teachers as a guidance, and the third, having certain kind of conscience about other people's feeling, and also the one is uh, having a courage, having uh, some sort of okay. I will do this, I can do this. You know, otherwise, when we talk about the Bodhisattva's activity, it seems like impossible and you just stop doing nothing, just say, oh, it's too hard or it is impossible. <clears throat> so having some sort of self-confidence and esteem that maybe it is too much, but I can do this, you know. Uh, instead of thinking too much what you cannot do, and you know, focusing what I can do because everybody has a potential to do something mm. yeah? and see how to use my own potential to do something. And uh, for conditions such as seeing or the hearing and getting inspirations from others about practicing and having the opportunity to study, contemplate and also appreciating you know, or being born as a human being, I've encountered with Buddhism and this Mayana path. It's, you know, and also the fourth is that understanding the redness of the Bodhicitta, Mayana's teaching in general, but especially Bodhicitta. And actually in the uh, text, Shantideva said that uh, having this sense of Bodhicitta, compassion, even for the moment, it's like a very rare, as, as red as the uh, thunder light. First of all, the thunder light doesn't come often, but when it, it comes, it doesn't remain for a long time. It just stays and go away. So it's such a, if you look at the whole, our the time of kalpas, you know, many, many years, so this is very like small fractions of time and opportunity. So it's very important to uh, appreciate, feel the gratitude towards all the causes and conditions about practicing, hearing, knowing about this Dharma in general, Bodhicitta. And also understanding that I should not waste it, you know, so having sense of the fragility or the urgency to use this in my mind or the Bodhicitta. <coughs> And the four powers, power of self, 